Yes, hello everyone. Hi, Joseph. Welcome to the second session of the Climate Controversies Lecture this year. My name is Miriam Overhoff. I'm the director of Philippine Bureau in Cologne, and I will be your co-host today. The Climate Controversies series in um, the Climate Controversies in Southeast Asia lecture is organized by Oliver Pai and Frank Seemann from the Department of Southeast Asia Studies at the University of Bonn in cooperation with the Asia House Foundation, Fridays for Future, Hochschulgruppe and the Philippine Bureau. In the Climate Controversies lecture, we could already welcome eight experts from Asia since November 2020, who reported and discussed the climate situation in the countries. After this lecture, there will be another one next week at the 27th of, no, uh, of January, and the lecture series will be concluded in two weeks with a panel discussion. I think it will be very, very interesting. And a very warm welcome to our speaker today, Joseph Purunganan. I met Joseph in 2019 for a meeting at Focus on the Global South in Castle City, and we worked together on a publication one year ago. Joseph is a well-known guest for our organizations, and we have all had several events with him and have worked together for many years. Thank you for that, Joseph. <laughs> And thank you very much for coming and sharing soon your experiences with us on the topic climate justice struggles in Southeast Asia. And I will hand over now to Isabel Kiel. Thank you, Miriam. I will quickly share my screen with you all. So hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Today's lecture is called Climate Justice Struggles in Southeast Asia. For this, we will welcome Joseph Purugan. He is the head of the Philippine Office of Focus on the Global South. His main area of interest is on the broad theme of, the, of political economy of development, where he has examined issues related to the World Trade Organization, free trade and investment agreements, and corporate accountability. Focus is part of Climate Justice Now Network and has participated in the campaign to demand climate justice. It has also examined the linkage between the climate crisis and coverage-driven development. It has done research on clean development mechanisms, threats, and other false solutions to climate change. Joseph was in Paris in December 2015 for COP21, where he wrote the statement, the world demands better which underscored the inadequacies of the Paris Climate, Paris climate Deal. Joseph also represents focus on the National Council of the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice. And um, I will quickly um, explain how the lecture work. First, we will have the lecture from Joseph for 30 minutes. And after that, we will have another 30 minutes for the discussion. So, Joseph, thank you a lot for coming today. We are all looking forward to the lecture. And I will now hand over to you. Thank you, Isabel. And thanks to Oliver and Miriam and all the other organizers for this opportunity to, to share our perspective and maybe uh, give you a glimpse. No? It's an overview of some of the struggles that are happening across the region. Uh, that are, can be linked to, to climate. Let me just share my screen now. Hopefully this will work. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, it's starting to rain now here in the Philippines and I, I hope there's no power outage in the next uh, one hour or so, so that I can <laughs> continue with the presentation. So I was asked by Oliver uh, to, oops, to give a, an overview of the, the struggles in Southeast Asia. And um, I want to start actually by introducing Focus on the Global South. Now, uh, Isabel already, uh, gave a short description. Uh, so FOCUS is a, 
is a progressive uh, policy think tank and campaigning organization that works mainly in, in Asia. Now we have our headquarters is in inside the Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, but we have offices in the Philippines, in uh, India, in uh, and in Cambodia. No? Um, Focus is uh, has was established 25 years ago. So we actually celebrated 25 our 25th anniversary last year. But obviously we didn't get to celebrate, or we didn't have. Uh, usually we will organize a big conference to celebrate that. But uh, hopefully this year we'll have a series of uh, discussions as well. Uh, and it was or focus was um, established. Uh, by Walden Bello uh, 25 years ago to look at contemporary development issues and um, expose the impacts of uh, corporate-led development on the poor and marginalized sectors and, and to challenge institutions that advance the corporate-driven globalization model and at the same time support and advance progressive and systemic alternatives. Um, as mentioned by Isabel, no, we were part of the, the founding of the Climate Justice Now Network in 2007, and our climate and environmental justice program somehow evolved from that. No, and our main, we see our main contribution to the movement in terms of establishing the links between the overall critique of development uh, with the. Um, you know, the grassroots struggles that are happening against the development projects, we see this as climate justice struggles. You know? So I think that, you know, somehow that introduction of focus is a good way also to introduce how I view this question of uh, climate justice struggles in the region. You know? It's important to, first of all, establish the, the challenge confronting uh, climate justice struggles in, in Southeast Asia. And I point to, to these two images here. Now, one is on the growth. And as you can see here, uh, these are the countries in this is GDP growth in 2019. No? And what this graph basically shows that it's a region of high growth. No, many, many economies in the region including the least developed countries, in fact, like Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, the Philippines is also up there. No? Very high, high growth, high GDP growth rates. No? And, um, but at the same time, we see this, uh, while there's that um, high growth trajectory, a big problem also is the inequality that continues to persist also across the region. And so what we can reflect on these two graphs and say that uh, the pursuit of growth and development in the region, while it has benefited some, you know, you're maybe familiar with the, the 1%. No? This is uh, the slogan that uh, somehow um, galvanized the Occupy uh, movement in the United States. No? The case in, in Southeast Asia, much of Asia and Pacific, is that it's it's worse. No, it's really point the point zero one percent against the ninety nine percent. No, so this means that only a small fraction of the population is actually the, actually benefiting from this kind of development, and the rest of us are either not benefiting at all, or worse, we we feel the negative impacts of this of this uh, high growth model that is why in my in my first slide really climate justice for us in southeast asia is a matter of survival it's a question of justice but it's also a matter of survival and i will try to expound on that as uh, we go along with the presentation so that's the question of growth and inequality. But if you look at now, if you look at um, carbon emissions in Southeast Asia, we see here that uh, well, fifty-five percent, the majority of the emissions from the region are actually contributed by Indonesia. But we also see here that uh, 
you know, in the case of the Philippines, it's quite small actually. And if you, this is comparing it in the region, in the uh, as a percentage of the regional con, regional greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions. But in, if you look at the global picture, emissions in many countries from in Southeast Asia are quite small, no. And that and there lies, I think, the the, the a critical point in climate justice struggles in the region is that while the contribution to to the, the problem of climate change, uh, if you look at it from a global perspective, is quite low, the impacts are quite high. And, and the next slide shows really that this is a vulnerability map. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen, seen it one way or another, no? But the this graph, if you haven't seen it, no, the, the more if the color is red, these are high high vulnerable, highly vulnerable uh, countries. And you, you, this is my country here, no? It, it's almost completely red, right? So what this means is that the Philippines is one of those most vulnerable countries to the negative impacts of climate change. And this is the the rest of Southeast Asia is here. You have your Thailand, Cambodia, also quite, you know, red in color. Uh, down below is uh, Indonesia here, some orange, some yellow, not so high impact. But that is, um, that under, this underscores the, like I said earlier, no, the climate justice struggle in the region. The contribution to the global greenhouse gas emission is not that high, but because we're vulnerable to the impacts, and there's and and within the economies, there's also a level of inequality, and so we're talking here of uh, differentiated impacts. No, that there's an inequality in terms of the impact. No, with poorer and marginalized sectors actually, you know, facing the most negative and most dire consequences of climate change. So just to summarize those initial points, no, uh, Southeast Asia is a region of high and sustained growth. While there have been advances in addressing poverty, income inequality, and wealth, concentration is a major problem. At the national level, we see benefits of this growth, but these are mostly concentrated also in urban centers. And as you move farther and farther away from the urban centers, you see high levels of poverty, right? What the climate crisis has done is, and this is a major point, now what because of this development path and because of this unequal growth, even before the, the climate crisis exacerbates these pre-existing problems, these pre-existing vulnerabilities. So that's, I think, an important point to consider. Another general characteristic of the situation in the region, which is perhaps best exemplified by the Philippines, as I said, no? is that while its contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions are low, the country is one of the most vulnerable to climate change impacts, as you can see in this vulnerability map. Now, I presented earlier uh, the emissions. Now, if we, this is uh, data that actually breaks down the emissions across the, what, what they call the five uh, developing countries. In, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, across the different sectors, so land use, transportation, energy, electricity and heat, manufacturing, um, other fuel combustions. Um, so Indonesia is the biggest contributor, right? And if you look at the Indonesian section of the graph here, you see that uh, seven, more than 70% of its emission come from land use issue of land use. And this is where you see agriculture and forest, forestry sector come in. No? Uh, in the case of the Philippines, it's quite, it's, it's the highest sector as well with 48 uh, metric tons, million, uh, what's this, a CO2 equivalent, uh, which represents around 30 or so percent of overall GHG emissions from the Philippines. Um, the energy and the electricity sector is another major contributor to the growth of emissions. And it's, uh, 
it's important to reflect on these figures uh, in terms of the growth in emissions. Um, that you know, it shows that while the pursuit of high growth and development has paid off for a few, it has it also has come with a price. No, and and the negative impacts on the environment are, unfortunately are felt most by communities in the margin. And it is also important to reflect on this data and relate them to the struggles that uh, some of the struggles that I will uh, describe in the later slides. No? So be mindful of these sectors and the struggles uh, that uh, I will describe later. One good resource that I found, and I don't know if uh, you're familiar with this, is this Atlas of Environmental ju ju uh, Justice, no? Environmental Justice Atlas, which um, documents and catalogs social conflict and environmental around environmental issues. So um, it says here in the description, no? across the world, communities are struggling to defend their land, air, water, forest, and their livelihoods from damaging projects and extractive activities with heavy environmental and social impacts from mining, dams, tree plantations, fracking, gas flaring, incinerators. As resources needed to fuel our economy move through commodity chain from extraction, processing, and disposal, at each stage, environmental impacts are externalized onto the most marginalized population. Often, this all takes place far from the eyes of concerned citizens or consumers of the end products. So the goal of this atlas and this and these reports are coming actually from the communities themselves, no, or the networks and the campaigns that are spearheading the struggles on the ground. No, you there's a process where you report the conflicts that are happening. No, so this is a way to really amplify, help amplify some of these struggles and. We will use this in, in looking at some of the struggles uh, across the region. Um, particularly, I'll just highlight two countries. No? One is Indonesia, where 128 cases of uh, environmental justice conflicts have been documented. And I will just like to point out three of the 128 cases that I, I think captures a range of sectors uh, and issues that are being tackled. There's the, the case of um, uh, palm oil plantation in Jambi province in Indonesia. And uh, the struggle there is being led by indigenous communities. There's that case in North Sumatra of coal-fired power plant. Uh, and then there's the case of nickel mining in uh, Southeast Sulawesi. So these are just some examples in Indonesia. No? As I said, 128 cases have been reported. And you can, I, I invite you to visit that atlas and you can search per country and, uh, and then you'll click on this, uh, the, the colored buttons here on the map to, to, to give you the, the particular cases. And the second country I'd like to highlight is my own country of the Philippines, where there are 64 cases reported in the Atlas. And again, I, I'd like to just give uh, three examples here. One is uh, a struggle against solid waste and, uh, and incineration in uh, Quezon City, here in, my, in, the, in the city where I live. Um, where environmental groups, uh, wet waste speakers and residents have protested the city government's uh, pursuit of uh, construction of incinerators, no? despite a national ban against incinerators and the, and the objections of local community. Another struggle, um, not in, the, in, the, in Quezon City, but in Quezon province, which is south of, of Metro Manila, is a, a struggle against the a Laiban Dam, or now, now 
uh, a more popular name for the project or um, segment of the project is the Kaliwa Dam Project or the new Centennial Water Source Project in Quezon Province. And this is a struggle of um, the Dumagat and Remontado in indigenous communities against a, a Chinese-funded dam project no? that is supposedly uh, a solution. It's a proposed solution to the water crisis in Metro Manila, but that dam project will unfortunately displace um, my, um, indigenous communities in the province. And then a third struggle, and this is a, a very unique struggle in the sense that um, we're talking here not just of a particular province, but an entire island. No? I'm talking about the Sikogon Island Tourism Estate Project in the Philippines. No? If you all recall that several years ago, uh, the Philippines was devastated by a super typhoon. The international name of the typhoon is Haiyan, but in the Philippines, it's called Yolanda. Typhoon Yolanda. And this, the island of Sikorgon was one of those badly affected by uh, Typhoon Yolanda. So in the aftermath of that typhoon, the farming and fishing communities had to flee, had to uh, evacuate from their communities and go into temporary shelters, right? So, but when they were, as, when the typhoon subsided, and they were able finally to go back to the communities. Now the, the residents were prevented from going back to their homes. And the, the typhoon and the displacement caused by the, by the typhoon was used by this um, big uh, multinational company, local uh, uh, big company called Ayala Land, to push for its agenda to put in place a Sikog, an island-wide tourism estate. You know? and, they, and so they're offering uh, to relocate many of the, the, the island dwellers away from the island, away from their lands, you know? because most of them are farmers and fisher folks, away from their livelihoods in order to pursue this uh, development project. So this is a case of in a way, what, what Naomi Klein referred to as disaster capitalism. You know, when, when a disaster, like a, such as a two, super typhoon, was used by corporate interests to actually push their agenda. Before that, you know, so what? These are just some of the struggles across the region, just six of the many, many struggles across the region. I'd like to point out what I see as the common elements of this really environmental justice struggles. One, most of the struggles, uh, struggles that I mentioned are led by frontline grassroots communities of indigenous peoples, of peasants, of fishers. No? But there are also broader multi-sectoral networks or movements that have been organized in support of the struggles of these sectors. Second, these are struggles that pit communities. So it's a battle between communities and large corporations. And unfortunately, in most of these cases, governments or the state take the side of corporations over the side of communities. Third point I would like to highlight, uh, these struggles are uh, as much about environment and climate as they are about human rights. No? The defenders of the environment have been met with human rights violations, displacement, criminalization, loss of livelihoods, and even loss of lives. Now, many of these struggles are, are, have been tragic no, for the, some of the leaders leading these struggles because of, especially now in the context of the Philippines where we have an authoritarian government no, and uh, the full force uh, of, of government is really being used to ram down the throats of these communities, all of these projects. No? To close, I'd just like to very briefly introduce two movements that, are, that, I, that I'm quite familiar with. And uh, one of it is uh, the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice that um, 
we we were part of the founding of this um, network here in the Philippines in 2010. And we were initially, we, we were for several years part of the coordinating count committee of PMCJ. And up to now, we are part of the National Council of PMCJ. Uh, PMCJ is, uh, was, was organized to advance the notion of climate justice as a solution to the climate crisis that the world is facing today. It was formed to lead the joint struggles, campaigns, and actions that would put forward the urgent demands for climate and comprehensive social, economic, and political transformation in the Philippines. The, the movement consists of 150 national networks, alliances, and local organizations representing basic sectors, grassroots communities, the marginalized, and the most vulnerable. I would love, I'm sure you're all familiar with 350.org. No, it's a it's an international network that also have it's that has operations in Asia and affiliates and works closely with various climate justice movements, including more recently the youth-led um, climate justice organizations, affiliated or inspired by the new movements that have emerged recently, like Fridays for Futures, Extinction Rebellion, and others. I think a key challenge, I, I, I ended with the introduction of this climate justice movement, because I think the key challenge that we face now is that how do we forge stronger links between the movements and struggles that are led by the frontline grassroots communities against the destructive development projects with perhaps the more traditional uh, climate justice movements as well as the new climate justice movements that are emerging. That is a big challenge and I think this effort of the, the Department of Southeast Asian Studies of Oliver and his colleagues to initiate this series of discussions um, as well as the efforts of networks like PMCJ and 350.org to initiate conversations across these movements on a wide range of environmental, climate, economic, social issues to define and advance solutions to the multiple crises and develop and promote alternatives. These are very important initiatives. And I think these are would, would contribute a lot to the building of a stronger climate, global climate justice movement. So let me end my, my very short overview of the struggles and uh, now welcome uh, questions or comments from everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I think it was a very interesting lecture and I think it's also very important um, that we learn about this because at least for me in my school we never learned about um, the climate injustice in Southeast Asia or let alone in Asia because we just talk about Europe so I think it's really really important that we talk about this so now we will enter our discussion so you can either um, open your camera and ask a question or if you are not comfortable with sharing your face, then you can just write in the chat and I will re read out the question out loud to Joseph. Um, can everybody hear me? Because Isabel, I hear you very softly, uh, but can everybody hear me very well? That's yes. great. Um, so Joseph, again, thank you very much for your lecture. And um, the spontaneous idea I, uh, that came up to me was, um, it is a while that we had somebody from the Greenpeace Philippines uh, here in our lecture, and um, who introduced um, uh, inter alia this problem with the uh, Yolanda uh, typhoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that you introduced so many uh, initiatives, how much do these initiatives, these NGOs work together? 
Yeah, well, it's a wide range of of groups and networks, no? And 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 I'm sure in Germany as well, you see that there are areas where we work together, areas where some groups focus, for example, more on lobbying governments, while the others concentrate on really doing more grassroots work. No, but um, in, in, in those spaces where we converge, I think we work very closely. Um, one area where you know, groups across this whole spectrum have worked on is this is this landmark case I, maybe the greenpeace uh, resource person mentioned this no that that was filed with the commission on human rights here in the philippines uh, so it's a human rights case against the carbon majors no so that 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 uh, initiative was able to draw in uh, different groups and different organizations from across the, the wide spectrum of climate justice networks. In our case, with FOCUS, we chose to work and be part of the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice because that's where we see, as I said earlier, no, our contribution, the way we see it is that we can uh, make stronger links between the overall critique of the economic development model of neoliberal corporate globalization that is being pursued with the on the ground climate justice struggles. So our, our goal in focus is really to help amplify those struggles on the ground and say that communities struggling against coal fired power plant in a province in Bataan, that is a climate justice struggle or indigenous communities fighting against Kaliwa Dam in Quezon, that is a climate justice struggle. No? So to really expand this notion of climate justice beyond the negotiations for climate. So it's, we're not really, we, we have been part of, we've been monitoring the uh, UNF C negotiations and we've participated in not all, but in some uh, COPs in the past. But we really see, we don't see real change happening because of what is being negotiated. No? And, and, and as I as well mentioned by Isabel in the introduction, our position on the climate uh, deal in Paris in 2015 is that it's not enough that the world demands a better deal, right? While there's a consensus among governments that it's a, it's a good, you know, it's a good consensus document, the experts in fact are saying that this would result to what four, five, five, uh, five degree warming, right? So really, I think if you want really some, um, radical change to happen, you have to support and really go down to the ground and really stop the projects that are exacerbating the climate crisis. I don't know if I answered it or I, I went uh, beyond the, the, the question, but thanks for that. Thank you, Joseph. Is anyone another question? Can I um, ask one if no one else is uh, ready yet? Um, can you maybe just expand a little bit on uh, the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice and um, what are your key demands? Uh, on a global level regarding climate justice in you know, a in, in a global sense? And what are your key demands for climate justice in the Philippines in the kind of more class sense? Yeah, so so in at the in at the global level, uh, it's really the demand is really to on develop develop countries, no? While we recognize the differentiated, uh, common but differentiated responsibility, I think we need to recognize as well the historical responsibility of uh, developed countries like uh, the United States and, and increasingly also like China. No? Um, that historical responsibility is important for developing countries like the Philippines because of this idea of the climate debt. 
no, that many of the impacts and the, the negative impacts that we continue to bear now is a result really of that, that the development that took place hundreds of years ago or many 50 hundreds of years ago in developed in developed countries in the in the west in the north that development happened because of the the well to a large part the extraction of resources from developing countries the colonization the the, the, the relationship between um uh the the colonized and the colonizing states no that that development was partly because of came at a price and that unfortunately the price had to be paid in not in in those countries but in developing countries like like the philippines no so that that is an important demand that we're trying to make at the international level at the national level and i i i, I showed the the sectors no and energy is a big sector in the philippines aside from land use no uh in fact the pmcj a, a big chunk of its campaigning is uh, is anti coal anti coal campaign um because uh the trajectory of development in the philippines is really you know to sustain high growth and unfortunately you need fuel to sustain high growth and the preferred fuel is really fossil fuel no and and particularly coal no and that is why you know uh despite the fact that we are very vulnerable to climate change the government this government and the previous governments have pursued um energy policies that still favor coal so there's an expansion continued expansion of coal projects in the philippines and pmcj is trying to organize and support uh sites of struggle against these coal-fired uh, power plants yeah um so that i have another question um um and now that you that you described um all, all, the, all the demands um I know that it's very difficult, the political, political situation in, in, in the Philippines. And, um, but what do you think, how much do you need to work together with the government? Or let me say with the, with the local, uh, uh, um, local people representing uh, the government? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Yuta. Another dimension that I did not, uh, was not able to present in the lecture is the issue of uh you know the the killings of environment and uh, land defenders in the philippines like there's a global witness report that you can look into where the philippines is i think uh the worst country in in the region as far as uh the killings of environment and land defenders and this is um particularly worrisome now under an authoritarian leader like duterte uh, we have new anti-terror laws that would give the government more power to, to designate any group or any individual opposing uh, some of these development projects or any group or individual or communities that are critical of government policies can be tagged as terrorists or can be red tagged as part of the communist movement. And when, once you're tagged as either terrorist or part of the communist movement, you are then subject to arrest or worse, you can be killed arbitrarily. You know, there's a, the, 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 the number of extrajudicial killings in the Philippines are rising. You know? at, at the beginning of the term of the administration, this was in pursuit of a war on drugs. But now we've seen that you know any form of dissent is now being uh, met with violence by this uh, very authoritarian state, and uh, this is particularly problematic for indigenous communities that are at the front line, because uh, because at the same time they are still struggling for recognition of their rights, particularly their rights over their ancestral lands. And these are the same ancestral lands that are being targeted 
by corporate investments into palm oil, uh, into uh, the, the big dam projects, mining projects. No? So there's that um, convergence of corporate interest and, and state interest in pushing these projects and driving away the communities no? and, and, and um, eroding the rights of, of people so, that are struggling against these projects. So it's a, it's a particularly challenging time, I would say. No? And, um, and, I, and in that sense, it's important that, that I, I ended by saying that there's that important objective of linking struggles. And I think that's, a, that's where the, the new strength can be, uh, can be obtained no? for this idea of common struggles. And especially the youth-led movements, it's important. I think to the credit of the youth-led movements, they were able to really amplify this call, this demand for climate justice not with, young, with their climate strikes, uh, et cetera. But they have to recognize that there are um, communities, whole communities that have struggled Maybe they're not called climate justice activists, but they have struggled against uh, development projects, against policies that exacerbate climate. And in fact, they are, it's important that uh, these struggles are supported uh, by many people so that you know, they, are, they are able to advance those interests. And they, that it's also, it also provides a protection against these uh, threats to human rights. If you just allow me um, to add, I think um, now with the Corona crisis, it will not be, be easier. No? I guess so. Yeah, and what we've seen is that um, while yeah, the, as you as you mentioned, no, the coronavirus, every everyone, everything was in lockdown, but we we saw that the the state uh, supported by the security forces. They continued to push for mining, mining projects to proceed despite the lockdown. You no, know? and another thing is that um, in the in the case of the Kaliwa Dam project that I mentioned, a key component there is uh, because this is inside an ancestral land of uh, indigenous community, you have to get free prior informed consent of the community, right? But because of the lockdown, uh, many of the and, and because of the, this whole atmosphere of militarization in the area, you know, consent can be forced upon, you know, the, the consent can be, you know, it's not free consent that is given. No? So now they're saying that there's the, the indigenous communities already have given consent and they are, um, they are dangling resources to get that support, no? So they are saying to community leaders, for example, support this project and we will provide you with additional livelihood. Or support this project and we will build the, the school, the badly needed school or hospital in your barangay, no? So it's really a, a very difficult situation for those resisting these uh, development projects. Thank you. We still have time. Does anyone else have any questions or want to say anything? Okay, if no one else wants to. Um, Joseph, it seems like in the Philippines you have a very broad coalition which manages to connect local struggles with a more generalized uh, critique of, of climate change. Um, uh, you know, as a global f phenomena. Um, do you see similar movements in that way in other Southeast Asian countries? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is, um, we, I mean, in Europe, the, the climate justice movement was quite, it was mainly activists, 
before. And then suddenly the Fridays for Future movement made it into this, you know, very widespread movement. So, um, you know, we had massive demonstrations. I mean, much, much bigger than we ever had before. Uh, and I mean, we, uh, you know, we joined the similar protests in, you know, in Paris and Copenhagen, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and the, you know, we had a broad coalition of different NGOs and, and, and movements, but um, it never reached the, the ground in that way. So this has made a big impact here. Um, so I was wondering why, why didn't this spread in the same way to, you know, school students in, in Southeast Asia? Well, well, to answer the, the, I think the the emergence of the youth-led movements, mainly in Europe and the U.S., have also been uh, have also impacted the the mobilizations and the movement building efforts here in in the Philippines and across Southeast Asia. I I spoke to in prepare in preparing for this lecture. I organize a meeting with the, the regional office of the 350.org just to find out how they're organizing across the region. And I'm happy to found, find out that in fact, the, the, while they are linking to, well, first that there are climate strikes and Fridays for Future affiliated or inspired movements across Asia. So that's one point. But secondly, that these movements have, in fact, evolved. Now, they've taken on this climate strike approach, but they are now moving towards addressing more systemic issues. Now, some movements, youth-led movements, have begun discussions on um, alternative development paradigms. Some movements have... have uh, made as part of their program exchange visits in, in affected communities of farmers or indigenous communities. So they have really expanded the idea uh, beyond you know, um, the, the, the climate strikes that are usually happening in, in, in the cities uh, and really embracing a, a, a much broader set of demands and it's and in, for me it's a good it's a positive development that they are open to and we're first that they recognize that these uh, grassroots struggles are important climate justice struggles and secondly that they are willing and open to have those cross movement conversations right and and in the region um Indonesia is quite strong as well, uh, as you know, only on as far as building uh, movements across different struggles. So you have, for example, groups working on trade, work closely with uh, those groups that are working on palm oil, against palm oil. Uh, Walhi is a big environment network, uh, Friends of the Earth Indonesia that tackle you know, a whole range of issues, uh, um, organizing farmers, fisher folks, uh, indigenous communities. You know? So there's that, there's that effort to build movements and look at convergence spaces, you know? this, this, this approach of convergence spaces. We've also tried to mainstream that in some of the regional platforms like the ASEAN uh, Civil Society Conference and ASEAN People's Forum, where the discussions now are not, not you know, uh, in silos, not in particular issues, but around convergence areas. And one one big convergence area, for example, is trade and climate, right? Where trade activists uh, have uh, conversations and look at issues and campaigns uh, together with you know climate climate activists. Thanks. Um, I would have one question back to the um, extrajudicial killings and so on we were talking a few minutes ago, um, because I experienced a lot of mistrust and also a lot of fear from civic society, civil society in the Philippines. And I'm thinking of the extrajudicial killings 
um, the killings of the environmentalists we were talking before, but also this, this climate of impunity, which is um, yeah, going around. And, and I was thinking about what, what would you think of our strategies on the local perspective, on the local level to, um, to involve civil society in all these struggles? We're actually part of a, a network, another network on human rights called uh, In Defense of Human Rights, I Defend Network. So it's a network of human rights organizations, but also uh, other uh, civil society organizations, as well as some grassroots organizations. Um, so where I Defend is um, engaged in several campaigns. One of them is a campaign against this impunity, you know? Uh, there's also a campaign on social justice and then a campaign on the war on, on drugs. Um, one At the international level, one, one target of I Defend is really to put pressure, is to get more international support and solidarity to put pressure on the government, on the Duterte government. So there are several platforms that we've been using. One is the United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, where we engage with governments across uh, the globe. No? And, and um, the latest development there is that the High Commissioner on Human Rights has put out a report, in fact, a skating report no, the, of the High Commissioner that says that the human rights violations in the Philippines are widespread and systematic. No? So this is not just related to the war on drugs, but even even the, the attacks against indigenous communities have been documented already. Unfortunately, the Philippine government has refused to acknowledge the report. And it has, in fact, come out with its own narrative in its own report. And the narrative of the Philippine government is to say that that is all not true. The human rights violations are not happening. And these are all just misinformation coming from very few but well-funded terrorist organizations, communist terrorist organizations. So they were able to really flip it back. And, and, and now it's a justification as well for pursuing a all-out war or counterinsurgency. No? And the, the, the really bad thing about that is that the environmental defenders, the, the communities, of farmers and indigenous indigenous peoples who are not part of the communist <laughs> movement are being targeted as well. So there's that general uh, sense of fear, as you said, no. Uh, so it's the it's really the state terrorizing its own people. You see a lot of in a lot of the communities where there are struggles, whether you you're speaking of mining struggles, dam struggles, land struggles. These communities are now very militarized. No, they are now very militarized, and uh, it it it's in the the space for organizing for educating communities have really have really diminished. No, there's that uh, the shrinking space, and and in and in the situation is really very problematic. Uh, that is why this is also the I think the important aspect of international solidarity work comes in and i defend is also hoping to to build a network of uh outside the philippines that support the human rights struggles inside the philippines so i don't know if i respond answered your question but that's what we are trying to do it's a very difficult situation that we have especially now with new laws anti-terror laws in place uh, the, the latest news now is that the, there's the University of the Philippines that is here in Quezon City. It's a, it has been a bastion of uh, activism no? uh, for, for many years, uh, dating back to the Marcos dictatorship. And there was a long time, almost 30 year agreement with the, de de the Defense Department that the, that the Department of Defense would recognize the autonomy of the university and it they cannot just go military and police cannot just enter the university and arrest anyone no but now the dnd has unilaterally abrogated that agreement so they are now saying that 
Yeah, UP is bastion of radicalism. It is a recruitment ground for terrorists and communists. Therefore, we should have, the military should have the, the freedom to go in and out of the university and arrest anyone who's uh, espousing uh, you know, these radical ideas. So it's a very dangerous time, no? And um, and uh, as I said, no, it's important that we more people are made aware of the real situation in the Philippines, and that hopefully there's more international solidarity in support of these struggles. Um, I would have another question, um, similar to what Oliver asked you before. Um, um, we we heard it. It, it was. One, only one note in, in the news here in Germany that uh, China and uh, Southeast Asia, the whole region built up an economic uh, zone, yeah, like NAFTA, yeah. Um, do you think that that will put more pressure on, on, on the Philippine economy? I mean, to, to, dig, to do much more mining and all this, so that um, it will, the environmental um, problems will increase. Yeah, you, you're, you're talking about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement or RCEP. Yeah, I, I didn't know the name. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a mega free trade and investment. So yeah. it's, it's similar to TTIP in, in you know, it's Europe and uh, US agreement that has been stalled, right? In many aspects, it, it, it is a new generation agreement in the sense that it's it covers not just goods, trade in goods and services, but also investments. No? Um, so we've been also campaigning against RCEP for many years. Uh, and um, we were worried uh, in the, throughout the campaign. And, and you have to remember that in these trade campaigns, we don't have access to the text of the agreement. So you only get access to the text of the agreements once the negotiations are completed. So in the past, we were worried that it would follow really the very ambitious agenda, uh, amb ambitious uh, template of new generation agreements. And now that we've seen some of the texts, um, we feel that some of our demands have been met in a sense, no? like, because the, the agreement is not so ambitious. But you are right, no? the 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 agreement has really um, inspired the government to pursue uh, similar agreements and to pursue uh, more this export-oriented uh, development model. And that's the problem with, it, with, um, with pursuing this model, that especially if you have, uh, if you have sectors like mining, you know, and extractive industry like palm oil, mining, that these are all for export. No, these are all, um, you know, the extraction of resources are are being done by by foreign companies for export. So very little development uh, benefits are really derived from these investments. No, they 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 benefit the corporations, but very because they because the because the it's not reinvested in the domestic economy and there's no there's very little links to the domestic economy it's really it's uh the the, the extraction of the resources really do not support development goals so that's the problem Some time. Does anybody else has a question? Okay, so if no one else has a question, then Joseph, would you like to say some concluding words? Well, I just want to thank again uh, the organizers, particularly Oliver, for inviting me, and I again. I, I, I see this as an important contribution to that effort that we're all trying to do 
in terms of you know establishing or building stronger links between the movements that have emerged mainly youth led movements with the movements that of of grassroots organizations that have struggled for many years against development projects i think it's an important work that needs to continue and i hope that the students and and those who have participated not just in this in this uh, particular lecture but in the whole series would really gain from this discussion a a, a sharper insight into what is happening in Southeast Asia. And hopefully this can be the start of building uh, international solidarity across these regions to support these struggles. So again, thank you very much for, for the time and the opportunity. Thank you a lot. So I would like to ask Yuta to announce the lecture that we, have to, that we will have next week. Okay, I guess Oliver is going to show us the 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 um, yeah the picture. Okay, thank you, Oliver. Um, so next week um, we um, are going to welcome uh, Marianne Klute, and uh, she is talking about climate and cement, the struggle of the salmon in the um, Kedang Mountains in Indonesia. And uh, Marianne is the director of a German NGO called Rettet den Regenwald um, to translate um, Save the Rainforest. And um, there she is um, working, especially on Indo Indonesia. And I think she will give us very interesting details to that. So I hope for a very interesting, another very interesting lecture. Thank you, Jutta, and thank you everyone for coming. And I hope a lot of you will come also next week. And again, thank, thank you, Joseph, for your time. And for this, you. I would like to end this lecture. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph. Joseph, Bye. good talk. Bye. Bye.